Okay, members, it is time for questions to the Executive Office. And as I inform members at the start of the sitting, the First Minister will be responding today. We will now start with the listed questions, and I call on Paula Bradshaw to, to ask the first question. Paula Bradshaw. Thank you. Question one, please. Minister. The Department of Health leads the work on mother and baby homes in Magdalen Laundries, while the Executive Office leads the work on historical clerical child abuse. Ministers are aware of the impact that clerical abuse has had on the lives of many individuals and the importance of progressing this work. The Working Group intends to commission a research project on clerical child abuse later on in this year. And whilst terms of reference will be formally agreed later, it is intended that it will cover opportunities to improve existing safeguarding practice as well as how best to engage with victims and survivors. Paula Bradshaw, supplementary. First Minister, uh, Minister, I met with Executive Office officials probably three years ago when they were talking about the terms of reference for this research. I'm just wondering, is there any way you could push this forward? Obviously, a lot of the victims are, are very distressed at this delay. Thank you. I want to thank the uh, member for her question, and indeed it's something that I know many of uh, the victims have been lobbying very hard uh, upon, um, and uh, I very much would like to see this work being taken forward uh, in, a, in a more timely fashion. As she will know, um, the Department of Health uh, appointed Judith Gillespie to take forward some of the work in relation to the mother uh, and baby homes, uh, and as part of that, um, she has been widely engaging. She was succeeded by Peter McBride, uh, as the member probably knows as well. Um, but all of this was happening uh, during suspension, and then uh, Ms Gillespie was appointed by the Department of Health uh, just recently. So it's important that we do take these issues forward. Uh, there's a, there's a, a lot to, to be done in relation to this matter. It obviously, in some ways, um, uh, also goes alongside the COSIGA appointment, uh, which I will address later on in questions. But it is important that we move all of these issues forward so that people can get closure uh, and can get uh, the restitution and justice that they so readily deserve. We call Colin McGrath, supplementary. Uh, Mr. Speaker, um, do our joint First Ministers uh, think that the compensation levels that were offered for the data breach by the Interim Advocates Office was um, suitable to the trauma that was some of the people uh, experienced? The Chair, better than most, will realise that this is a legal process and therefore we are dealing uh, with our lawyers at present and they are dealing with all of these matters and I think uh, that it would be wrong of me to intervene on all of those matters because some of them will end up in court, uh, Mr Speaker, and therefore it is important that we reference that and respect that. I call Linda Dillon. Thank you. Minister, for your questions thus far, can the Minister outline just in relation to clerical abuse, is it intended that there would be a similar type redress scheme as there is currently in place in relation to HIA? Well, in terms of the mother and baby homes, if uh, people were in institutions such as those um, up until the age of 18, they can apply for a redress through the current scheme uh, that is there. And so we will have to see after the piece of work that is done by Judith Gillespie at present. Uh, and indeed, uh, in terms of the, term, the wider terms of reference for uh, clerical abuse, if there are any gaps remaining there. But uh, I, sh I should say very clearly uh, that those who were in mother and baby homes uh, up to the age of 18 can seek redress uh, through the Historical Institutional Abuse Inquiry. Call Jerry Carl. I want to ask the Minister how her office will ensure that the voices of victims are heard uh, who feel let down and excluded so far will be heard during, uh, throughout and at the end of this process, how the voice of victims be heard. Thank you. Well, I think we have made good strides in terms of listening to the voices of victims. As I say, I'll answer in relation to the Commissioner appointment uh, later on in questions, but it is important that we also reference the fact that Judith Gillespie is proceeding with her piece of work and is um, working with victims and survivors as well. I think that is important. This is a very difficult uh, piece of work that she's taking forward, but an important piece of work, uh, and we wish her well and look forward to what she has to say after she's finished it. Uh, next question, I call William Humphrey. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Question number two. <clears throat> Mr. Speaker, with your permission, I will answer questions two and nine together. 
Whilst COVID-19 is primarily a health pandemic, it is also causing significant societal and economic impacts. The Executive's response therefore aims to deliver a balanced package of measures across all these areas that will target support where it is needed most. The Executive's approach continues to be flexible in responding to the emerging situation. Most recently, this has included the introduction of restrictions in domestic settings, initially on a postcode basis and then extended to all households given the concerning levels of transmission across the community. The focus of these restrictions on household settings is informed by the evidence we have from the Test Trace Protect programme, which tells us that household transmission and informal interactions in the community are playing a role in increased positive case numbers. We continue to keep the situation under very close review and are prepared to respond as necessary to flatten the rate of infection and ultimately save lives. These have been the most challenging of times for people, and we understand that people are weary of COVID-19. But it is crucial that everyone continues to follow the consistent public health messaging. The Executive's High Impact Cross-Platform Public Information Campaign continuously reinforces the message around social distancing, maintaining good hand and respiratory hygiene, wearing face coverings and downloading the Stop COVID NI app. We want to ensure this information is communicated to all as wide an audience as possible, and last week the Deputy First Minister and I made a public address to update everyone in the community on the current situation and reinforce those crucial messages. This was broadcast live on a number of platforms, and the viewing figures for the BBC alone were over 230,000. William Humphrey, supplementary. Minister, for her answer so far. And can I take this opportunity on this, the 28th of September, to wish the First Minister a very happy Ulster Day? Many of the members in this House will have been contacted by constituents concerned about cancer care for their loved ones, or indeed for themselves. Can I ask the First Minister, is she satisfied that progress is being made on access to non-COVID treatments in our health service? Well, I thank the member and wish him a happy Ulster Day as well. And, uh say to him in relation to the non-COVID health care that this is a matter uh, that does actually uh, concern the executive greatly. Uh, I was pleased that the health minister brought forward his uh, new cancer strategy paper uh, to the executive last week uh, and then has informed this house through a written statement uh, around all of that. Uh, it's very important that we look at the short and medium term plan to rebuild and indeed to stabilise our cancer, oncology and haematology services because that rebuilding plan is critical to trying to deal with all of those very difficult diagnoses that are out there uh, and we very much want to focus on this as well as of course dealing with COVID. We do want to make sure that the trusts have their plans in place to deal with all of the non-COVID health care as well. I call Steve Egan. Your supplementary to question nine was grouped with two. Oh, sorry. Uh, sorry, my apologies. I withdraw the question. I call Pat Cadney. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, uh, uh, Joint First Minister, I was going to ask Has the Department reviewed the communication strategy about the COVID response? Well, as I indicated in my substantive answer, uh, we did make a uh, a communication directly to the people of Northern Ireland last Tuesday, but I think one of the issues that we have been concerned about over this past number of uh, days and weeks is me the messaging for our young people uh, and the ability to get the message to our young people, and it's important that uh, everyone hears and understands and acts upon uh, key messages, and we have now put in place a, a digital campaign which is targeted specifically at our young people uh, working in partnership with organisations like Cool FM um, and obviously using social media and indeed something called Mobster, which uh, the member might be able to tell me what it is, but I'm not quite sure what it is. I'm sure many of our young people uh, would, would be able to tell me, but apparently uh, we're going to use Mobster uh, to do some digital advertising, which will target 16 to 25 year olds, uh, based, including students, based on their location data. So obviously if they're in Queen's, if they're in the University of Ulster or whatever, then we're able to uh, get some messages uh, to them. Um, so we are very much proactively looking at our messaging and making sure that we get messages out as wide as we possibly can. Call Doug Beattie. 
Mr. Speaker and, and Minister. Uh, I often travel under these electronic road signs on the motorway which say um, a speed limit is not a target. Uh, in other words, just because you can doesn't mean you should. Therefore, can I ask the Minister if she believes the other executive party leaders undermined the executive's health care message by travelling down to Dublin to do a meeting that could have been done on Zoom? matter that I'm sure um, my colleagues will be able to answer for themselves. It is important that we do give leadership uh, in these issues um, and that we set forth uh, what we would expect other people to do as well. I happen to think that uh, advertisement of the speed limit not being a target is a very effective um, uh, advertisement and I hope that we can use more of those sort of quirky advertisements to get out our COVID message as well because it is important, as I say, that we reach as many people as possible. Next question, I'll call Jerry Kelly. Three, question three, please. Uh, Mr. Speaker, with your permission, I'll ask Junior Minister Kearney to answer this question. Ministers in the executive have a shared commitment to ending sectarianism. Positive work is ongoing across the Together Building a United Community strategy to tackle sectarianism and other forms of intolerance in our society. In May, the Department of Justice appointed just, uh, Judge Desmond Marinan to carry out an independent review of hate crime legislation here. Judge Marinan is due to provide his final report to the Minister of Justice for consideration by the end of this November. And it's necessary to wait the outcome of that review before further decisions can be taken on a way forward. Jerry Kelly, supplementary. Thank you, Minister, for his answer up till now. But in, in terms of the NDNA uh, commitment, um, will the Minister, con Minister confirm his commitment that the Executive will bring forward concrete proposals, and I quote, to formulate and require the, all public representatives to commit uh, to an anti sectarian pledge? A whole society approach is required to tackle the scourge of sectarianism in all of its manifestations in our society, and I am very mindful and indeed fully supportive of the commitments which are contained in the new decade new approach to end the sectarianism, which include an enhanced strategic focus within the programme for government on ending sectarianism, a reaffirmation of support for the right to freedom from sectarianism, sectarian harassment and intimidation, and a wish to see sectarianism given legal expression as hate crime, and also a commitment that the Executive should formulate and require all public representatives to commit an anti-sectarian pledge. There is, however, a particular responsibility on all public representatives to lead by example, and I am committed to working with executive colleagues to bring forward practical proposals on an anti-sectarian pledge for all public representatives in a manner that delivers and is consistent with our NDNA commitments. Indeed, I am committed to engaging and working with all Assembly colleagues who are committed to exploring how we may collectively make a stand against sectarianism as the basis of building an inclusive, shared and better united future for all of us. I call Jonathan Buckley. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. You'll forgive me for nearly choking on the words anti sectarian pledge from the member. Does the junior minister recognise the crass hypocrisy involved by Mr. Kelly and indeed his own response to this question, given that over the course of the weekend, Mr. Kelly not only glorified but gloated in a terrorist escape at the maze which resulted in the murder of a prison officer and, and resulted in the injury of another? And does he accept that this stands in stark contrast? towards building a united community. This is shameful actions from a member of the Northern Ireland Policing Board. Sectarianism, sectarianism is accepted as a form of racial abuse. After over 10 years of a DUP Sinn Féin duopoly here, can the Office of the Joint First Ministers tell me at what stage is their department at with a long overdue implementation of a racial equality strategy?
Well, my way has done done cold. I sought and cast shun occur. Um, the uh, the member, of course, uh, will 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 be aware that uh, we have a five-party uh, power-sharing coalition. His own party uh, is an integral part of that coalition. We have commitments which rest at the very heart of uh, the restoration of power sharing in relation to taking forward NDNA. We have a racial equality strategy from uh, uh, 20, uh, 2015 through until 2025. And the work involved in relation to uh, addressing uh, racism within our society must be seen as part of the overall package of how we eradicate intolerance and all forms of bigotry in our society, regardless of the source or against which section of society that is targeted towards. And, and the work that we have in hand uh, in the context of that strategy continues apace. And it's my firm view that all ministers, and I hope all parties who are members of our power sharing executive, will share the common ambition of taking forward and implementing that strategy successfully so that we can, in fact, build a genuine, shared, inclusive and united society. I call Jim Allister. Does the minister think it would help towards a shared, inclusive society if his party, not least the questioner in this case, put an end to tweeting the glorification of terrorism? which in many cases was crassly sectarian in itself in the choice of victims by the IRA. Would he like to give a lead by indicating that his party will now eschew such glorification of terrorism, or will we be subject to more of the same? Well, I thank the member for that question. And uh, the reality, as, as the member well knows, is that we, uh, we all have narratives around our past, the conflict that we've lived through the last 100 years. Those narratives are in conflict with each other. But we need, particularly in the context of this mandate of renewed power sharing, to come together on the basis of respecting different narratives, to agree to disagree. We will not agree on the past. But we can do our level best collectively, inclusively, to try and build a united future for everyone in, the, in this society. And next year marks the centenary of uh, partition in our island. And next year can throw up the prospect of a very, very contested year where we disagree vehemently in relation to what happened in the past. But perhaps one of the considerations, and I invite the member to take this point on board for some further reflection, one of the things that we should actually try and do next year is rather than descend into the vortex of continuing and relentlessly fighting over issues of the past, that we look towards the centenary of partition as an opportunity to develop a new dialogue and discourse within our society about how, in fact, we can build for the future. Next question, I call Melissa McHugh. The North West Development Fund has approved funding in place until December of 2021. This includes an extension of the funding period to take account of COVID pressures on projects. The total committed investment by the Executive is approximately £2.15 million. This commitment is matched funded by the Republic of Ireland's Government, as agreed in the Fresh Start Agreement of 2015. The North West Development Fund has delivered a number of successful projects across three regional development pillars. Some examples are developing economic growth through trade and investment missions, developing the physical environment by contributing to the Interreg Green West project, and through the North West Sports Development, strengthening community cohesion and well-being. Melissa McHugh, supplementary. I got, I, thank you, Minister. Uh, supplementary, just will, the, will you provide uh, an insurance 
uh, to work with the Dublin government uh, to deliver the NDNA commitments to provide further financial support to the fund. I thank the member for his supplementary. The reference in the New Decade New Approach at page 60 states that the Republic of Ireland's government is committed to exploring opportunities for investment that will further support opportunities to bring greater economic prosperity and social benefits to the wider region and in principle provide further funding to the North West Development Fund in collaboration uh, with the Northern Ireland Executive. I understand that the North West Regional Development uh, Group has, or Development Group has recently written uh, to us uh, seeking a continuation of the fund uh, beyond the current arrangements, which as I say is up until the end of 2021, uh, Mr Speaker. Uh, so we will be looking at that uh, in the future to see uh, what is possible and also looking at how uh, broad the fund can be right across uh, the North West because we think it is important that there is equity uh, in how the fund is distributed. Thomas Buchanan. Thomas Buchanan. Towards the First Minister accept that there is much more to the North West than the, than the Maiden City, and our Minister is open to the wider hinterland and the areas extending out further than the Maiden City, that they can also benefit from this particular funding? Well, yes, I do uh, accept that the North West is greater than the Maiden City, and uh, it is important that that is recognised, I think, uh, by the Council uh, in Derry and Strabane, but also uh, in Causeway Coast and Glens as well, that that is taken into account because the North West uh, does go across uh, a number of regions, and it's important that that is reflected in the work going forward. Next question, call Gemma Dolan. My August, Kesha Kuig, question five. Uh, Mr Speaker, with your permission, Junior Minister Kearney will answer this question. There are several potential amendments to the Fair Employment and Treatment Order 1998 being considered by various business areas within the Executive Office. These extend to the inclusion of monitoring information as regards nationality and ethnic origin, the repealer amendment of the teacher's exception in Article 71 created in 1976 to address the imbalance in employment opportunities for teachers, and also an amendment of Article 24 to reflect the changed circumstances of a post-conflict society enabling ex-prisoners and their families to transition into making a positive contribution to society. Gemma Dolan, supplementary. Thank you, and I thank the Minister for his answer. Um, could the Minister outline the progress made to implement the employer's guidance in respect of public sector recruitment and vetting? We have done call to ask Octon Kesh and occur, and yes, I can. Uh, the employer's guidance was designed to assist employers to follow best practice and it is aimed at reducing barriers to employment and enhancing the reintegration of those with conflict-related convictions. This week, Junior Minister Lyons and I met with members of the review panel for an update on their work. We had a very positive and informative discussion with panel members, and we recognise that a lot of good work has been taken forward and continues to be so. However, whilst there has been a number of areas where Key success and progress have been made to date, including intervention on individual cases. Several issues still remain to be addressed, and progressing this work and continuing to engage with the review panel will be a priority in the period ahead. I call Chris Little. Mr. Speaker, does the Minister agree that the exemption of teachers from the Fair Employment and Treatment Order is archaic, and will the Executive Office bring forward legislation to repeal this exemption of teachers from legal protection from employment discrimination on the grounds of religious belief and political opinion? Well, Mawai has done called that Sokhtan and Kesian occur. Uh, the member will be aware that Article 71 has been enshrined in legislation with a view to effectively providing for uh, lawful discrimination for the employment of teachers in both the controlled and the maintained uh, sectors. Uh, the, uh, the department, TEO, 
uh, does have responsibility for bringing forward the, uh, the relevant legislation for amendment, but clearly the Department for Education will have a significant input and opinion in relation to what those kind of amendments could or should look like uh, in the future. And I can advise the member that uh, a meeting is scheduled for next week uh, where uh, officials from uh, TEO will be engaging with uh, officials from the Department uh, for Education to take forward that discussion uh, among officials at this stage. Next question, Colin Gillernoy. My Agad, can call you Kesht Evera Question number six, please. The selection process for the Commissioner for Survivors of Institutional Childhood Abuse was launched in June, with interviews taking place in mid-August. Those candidates assessed as appointable by the selection panel give a presentation to the Deputy First Minister and myself on the 9th of September. We are currently in the final stages of the appointment process, and once the requisite pre-appointment checks are completed, the Deputy First Minister and I will make a formal announcement regarding the Commissioner's appointment. Colin Gillard, new supplementary. I thank the Minister for her answer. Um, does the Minister agree that the appointment of the new Commissioner prevents, presents a renewed opportunity uh, to progress all the heart recommendations, in particular with a focus on the apology? I thank the Member for his supplementary. And to say to him, um, just to remind members that the heart report recommended uh, to ourselves that uh, those who were responsible for each of the institutions investigated by the inquiry where it found systematic failings should make a public apology as a wholehearted and unconditional recognition of the failures of the past. And very much this is something that the new Commissioner will take forward, uh, as well as uh, the memorial, which I think uh, we would want to see progressed as well. Obviously, uh, uh, the Commissioner will need to do that in conjunction uh, with the victims and survivors to make sure that it is an appropriate uh, apology and an appropriate memorial, but certainly that is something that the new Commissioner should take upon herself or himself uh, very quickly. Call Paula Bradshaw. Mr. Speaker, um, Minister, thank you for that um, response. I've heard you mention that um, several times in the Chamber around how you'll be working once the new Commissioner is in place, but um, it's 45 months now since the Heart um, recommendations were, were, were made. and. What is preventing you and the Deputy First Minister from making a joint apology in this chamber? Well, because I think it's important that all of the institutions who have been named in that report should make the appropriate apology. It's one thing for me to stand here and make the apology, but I think very much the victims and survivors would want to hear it directly from the institutions involved as well. And that's why we have someone to uh, work with the victims and survivors. And look, I accept that whilst the interim advocate has been employed in some of that business, that there has been some difficulties around that. Uh, we would have wished it were otherwise, but uh, that's where we are at present. Uh, however, I am hopeful that we'll have the new commissioner in place very shortly because we're in the midst now of uh, just uh, pre-security checks and all of those sorts of things so that we can take the matter forward and that they can deal with it very quickly. Call Colin McGrath. I congratulate the department on uh, coming to the end of a process of appointing somebody. Does the First Minister not think that this House deserved a verbal update today about the appointment of the Head of Civil Service rather than us having to find most of the information out from the press? Well, as the member is aware, at least I hope he's aware, there was a written statement placed uh, with your office, Mr Speaker, over the weekend because we knew that this was a matter of some note uh, and therefore that written statement uh, is available to all. Paul well, Gordon Dunn. Thank you, Mr Speaker, and I thank the First Minister for her answers. Um, in relation to the payment of compensation to the innocent victims and their families, what progress has been made in recovering some funding from the clerical orders and other institutions who run these deplorable homes? Well, the cost estimates for financial redress range from $149 million at the lower end to $402 million as a central estimate, up to $668 million at the upper end. And contributions from the institutions that I've already referenced would help to defray uh, some of those costs. 
Uh, a potential meeting was discussed with the two Archbishops, that's the Archbishop of the Church of Ireland and the Archbishop of the Roman Catholic Church, and we will shortly be writing to both Archbishops and to the institutions uh, seeking to hold a roundtable meeting to emphasise the seriousness of, of this, these negotiations and the urgency of making progress and to seek to agree principles which would govern uh, those negotiations. I think, of course, it is a moral imperative and I think it would be very warmly welcomed by the victims and survivors if the institution stepped up in that way. And that ends the period for a list of questions. We now move on to 15 minutes of topical questions and I call Gordon Dunn. Again, thank the Minister for coming today. Uh, in relation to the protest that was held at the maze uh, at the weekend, I, I understand it was facilitated within the grounds of the prison, something which is a de deplorable and unacceptable act. Can the First Minister give us assurance that she will follow up with the responsible authorities, including the Justice Minister, on this issue? Well, thank the member for his question. As I, uh, the Justice Minister uh, did alert her executive colleagues to the fact that this protest was taking place at the weekend. However, I note what the member has said in relation to where the protest took place, and we'll certainly be looking for an update from her in relation to that matter. Gordon Don Submetry. Mr Speaker, can the, the First Minister give us an assurance that this will not reoccur? And uh, I, I must say that the matter, I was in the Justice Committee when the matter was raised by the Chairman with the Chief Constable, made it very clear that such a protest was not welcome in the area and that the Chief Constable should take some action in relating to it. The Chairman made that very clear at the time and I think we're extremely disappointed with the outcome. Say this to the member. I'm sure the uh, policing board will address this matter in due course. Of course, operational decisions by the chief constable are, will, should be reported there and accountable to uh, the policing board. However, uh, I will take the matter up uh, that he has raised with the justice minister in relation to where the protest actually took place at the prison. I'm going to call Tom Buchanan. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, minister, can I ask you have you any discussions? Or have you any plans for any discussions with the US envoy, Mike Mulverney, over the course of his visit to Northern Ireland? Yes, I thank the member for his question. Uh, Mr Mulvaney has been appointed by the Trump administration to be uh, an envoy to Northern Ireland, uh, principally around economic development. So we very much look forward to speaking to him. Uh, around his ideas around economic development uh, and the Deputy First Minister and I were due to meet Mr Mulvaney um, uh, tomorrow morning early on. I think he's also due to speak to the other executive ministers as well at that stage. Toby Cannon. Thank you, Minister, for uh, that uh, answer. And, uh, what role does she believe the US can usefully play in helping to build sustainability again within Northern Ireland? Well, the member is probably aware uh, the US is our biggest international investor in Northern Ireland. Many firms are US uh, based and then they come and they invest here in Northern Ireland. And they do that because of the strength of our people here and the skills that they have. Uh, and we very much want to develop with Mr Mulvaney uh, where he sees the upcoming opportunities for trade and investment in particular. I understand that he has a particular interest around financial technology and cyber security. So those are areas that we are very strong upon. So I'm looking forward to having that conversation with him tomorrow, and I hope that we can further drive uh, economic investment into Northern Ireland, as I say, based on our people, based on our skills and our ability to do business. Can I call Claire Sugden? Thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, the First Minister has publicly voiced her support for what could be called Charlotte's Law in Northern Ireland. Now, I appreciate that that would fall to the remit of the Minister of Justice, but how is the First Minister, as the Chair of the Executive Committee, um, influencing this piece of legislation? Well, I thank the Member for her question, and I understand that this matters to be debated in this House later on uh, today. I have met uh, with both families who are campaigning around this. I think it is completely inhumane that the person who commits uh, murder then does not tell the family where the body is to allow closure. Uh, and I think it is right that that should be reflected in the justice system. Uh, and I hope that this House will have its say today. And I do hope that they back this campaign, the campaigns of two families, uh, who no doubt will be watching very closely what we have to say on this matter.
Claire Stoglin, supplementary. I thank the First Minister for her comments, and, and I, I share her comments entirely. Um, how does the First Minister feel that with less than two years le left of this particular mandate, that it is unlikely that we're going to get this onto the statute before the next election in 22? Would there be another opportunity, perhaps through an LCM, uh, of the Westminster legislation that's currently passing through the Commons? I think that's something that we should discuss. Um, if we get the House to back this motion today, then we should look at the next stage as to how we can progress the issue, whether it's through this House or through an LCM. Um, dealing through the Westminster piece. Obviously, we would always much prefer to have our own legislation here in Northern Ireland, um, but if uh, we're unable to do that, then the possibility of an LCM with Westminster uh, should certainly be looked at because it's about bringing closure to a family who's grieving greatly and trying to find a way to deal with that grief. Call Jonathan Buckley. Minister, yesterday marked National Police Memorial Day, where we as a nation rightly pause to reflect on those gallant police officers who have lost their lives while on duty throughout the United Kingdom, a day which is particularly poignant in Northern Ireland, where since 1969 over 300 officers have been killed and many thousands injured. Will the First Minister join with me in ensuring that the police officers who gave their all were ne are never forgotten and always remembered for their commitment and ultimate sacrifice and commitment? Yes, I do thank the member for his question. And ordinarily, I would have been attending National Police Memorial Day yesterday. It happens on a UK basis, and the four nations take it in turn to host that uh, memorial service. Of course, made all the more poignant um, yesterday by the killing um, on Friday of Sergeant Rattanen um, in Croydon Police Station. And we do send our sincere sympathies to his family and his colleagues at this time. We unfortunately know too well here in Northern Ireland what it is to have police officers killed uh, and murdered, and therefore it is important that our public servants are remembered in this way. And I was particularly pleased uh, to see the family uh, of uh, David Johnson meet with our own Chief Constable because, of course, David Johnson, along with his colleague John Graham, were murdered in the streets of Lurgan in 1997, and it is important and right that we remember their sacrifice. Supplementary, Jonathan Buckley. Thank the First Minister, and I know she knows full well the threat to those who serve in our police office today is still something that's very real uh, and brought into sharp focus, as she has mentioned, by the tragic murder of Sergeant Matt Ratna of the Met Police. Would she agree with me that, as a matter of urgency, we must legislate for tougher sentencing for those who attack our emergency services and, indeed, support mandatory life sentencing for those who callously murder them? Yes, I mean. The Subject matter of sentencing is something that I think the House will come back to in the near future because, as I understand it, uh, the Justice uh, Minister has a consultation before in relation to sentencing matters. Uh, we in Northern Ireland have the lowest uh, sentence in relation to murders of police officers. When I look south of the border and I look to the Republic of Ireland and I see that they have a mandatory 40-year sentence for capital murder of police officers without any discretion. Uh, for judges. In England it's 30 years, in Scotland it's 20 years. So there is a need for us uh, to step up uh, and to look at sentencing as punishment, of course, but also as a deterrent to those who would seek to murder our public servants. And I call Martina Anderson. Uh, First Minister, could I ask you if you can, could you outline the total investment that has been made by the Executive Office to the Ebrington site in Derry, please? I thank the member for her question. And to date, uh, the Executive Office has invested £38 million uh, in regeneration of Ebrington, uh, £15 million from 2016 when uh, we took responsibility uh, over for the regeneration of the site. Uh, and we've had quite significant investment uh, in the site, as, sh as she will well know. Uh, and it's important that we continue with that uh, development. We've been able to attract in private sector investment uh, as well, which we very much welcome. Uh, and 23 of the 24 site buildings have an expression of interest, an agreement of lease or a lease in place. So that's, that's very good progress on the Ebrington site. Uh, and we will continue to work with our partners in the North West uh, in relation to the development of Ebrington. Supplementary, Martin Anderson. 
you. Thank you for that information. That will be much appreciated, I think, for the people of Derry to hear that. Um, also, Minister, there has been uh, lots of engagements going on between the Executive Office and the Council with regards to the transfer of some of the buildings to Council, maybe on a phased basis with a few of ultimately it all being held with Council. Could you give us an outline as to kind of the nature of the discussions that are taking place between the Executive Office and Council? So the council is very much a key partner with us uh, in Ebrington, and they, like us, want to see the site up to its full potential. Um, the transfer of the site is being progressed on a phased approach. Is absolutely correct uh, in that. And the first phase of the transfer process relates to the delivery of the Maritime Museum uh, on Ebrington. Uh, and the council is developing a business case for the project and has identified uh, funders. And we are committed uh, in the executive office to providing £3.3 million uh, towards what I think is £11.5 million of a project. So it's a very significant project uh, for the North West. It's actually quite an exciting project in the Maritime Museum, and I hope it will uh, realise its potential. As I say, we're working with the Council and will continue to do so. Liz Kim is not in her seat. I move on to Paula Bradshaw. Um, Minister, the um, NHS COVID-19 app was relaunched last week in GB, and it included the option for Welsh. I'm just wondering, is any consideration given to our app here in Northern Ireland being put into Irish as well? Uh, I don't think there has been consideration of that, but that would be a matter for the De uh, Department of Health to come forward, uh, probably based on uh, need, and if people have been asking for that uh, in the Irish language. I'm not sure that that has been the case. There's certainly been no discussion around it. Paula Bradshaw, supplementary. Um, thank you for your response. I'm just wondering then, in the spirit of the new decade, new approach and the moves to take forward legislation around Irish language and other minority languages, would it not be a good idea in the spirit of moving forward? I think the primary purpose of the COVID, Stop COVID NI app is to protect and save lives. And um, I think that has always been the focus. It's been about saving lives and saving livelihoods. That has been certainly the collective focus of everyone in the executive our five-party coalition, uh, not a duopoly, as one of the members, I think, uh, said earlier on. I'm always amazed, Mr Speaker, how it's a duopoly when some people don't like what we're doing, and it's a five-party coalition when we want to take credit. But in any event, it is a five-party coalition, uh, and people should remember that, uh, and therefore we will work together to save lives and protect livelihoods. And I call Palm Cameron. Speaker, um, can I ask the First Minister for an update on the enforcement group that, which is being headed up by the junior ministers? So the enforcement group that has been headed up, as she rightly says, by the junior ministers has been set up. Primarily it was focused um, on the Holy Land and the difficulties that were there in relation to the restrictions. Uh, it is much wider than that now and we are continuing to work with our partners, the PSNI, uh, local government. Um, and indeed uh, everyone else involved in enforcement so that we can make sure that as well as having the restrictions in place that there is an effective enforcement regime as well. Pam Cameron, supplementary. First Minister, for her answer. Um, First Minister, what uh, reports have been received in the past week on the activities in the Holy Lands in particular? Well, I think that the um, police presence in the Holy Lands has helped with some of the difficulties that were there. I do regret the fact that um, there were a number of notices handed down to students and indeed that some students uh, were suspended. But it is important that we continue to try and work with our young people uh, to get the message across to them. Uh, I note that there is, are some students currently self-isolating in the halls of residence and of course we do send them our best wishes um, and hope that it doesn't become a wider spread. Um, the executive office uh, is meeting with the universities, both universities tomorrow, uh, to discuss some of these issues that are before us. Uh, I know that there have been many scare stories out there uh, about our universities and our young people, but I believe in our young people. I believe on the whole our young people want to do what is right and I would appeal to them uh, to abide by the public health guidance and the restrictions that are there. I call William Humphrey. Thank you very much Mr Speaker and thank the First Minister for her answers this afternoon. Can I ask the First Minister what support has the Executive been providing to the economy and in particular 
the aerospace industry here that is so vital to this city of Belfast, many of my constituents and people across the city, but also wider Northern Ireland in terms of the importance of our Northern Ireland PLC economy. The Executive Office very much recognise the importance of the aerospace sector. Um, we also recognise that it is not just an issue for us here in Northern Ireland, but for colleagues in Scotland and Wales as well. And that is why we took the opportunity to write to the Prime Minister, along with our counterparts in Scotland and Wales. Um, and uh, this was a, uh, an initiative from Unite the Union, and we were very happy to do that because we believe that there needs to be more recognition uh, of the aerospace sector. It provides us with some very well-paid, highly skilled jobs. We are very fearful for the sector and we want the uh, Whitehall uh, Westminster to take the initiative because it is something that needs to happen on a pan-UK basis because it is a huge issue and huge amounts of money are involved in the sector. Unfortunately, Mr Humphrey, time is now up and uh, could I ask members to take your raise to change the table.